Learning About Life. After this lecture, you'll be able to answer the question, what is science? And you will be able to explain how we study science using the scientific method. You will learn how living things are structured and highly organized. And you will be able to define the characteristics of life, that is, how living things differ from non-living things. Lastly, we'll briefly discuss biology's chief unifying principle. What do you know about science and studying science? Science, no matter the discipline, is a way of learning about the natural world opposed to the supernatural world, which we cannot see and therefore cannot study. Science and scientists should be objective of reporting factual data as opposed to subjective, reporting their opinions or personal feelings. Science is falsifiable, which means conclusions that one scientist made from conducting experiments may change or be modified as we learn more about that topic or as new technology is developed. We study science using the scientific method. The first step of the scientific method is making observations about something in the natural world. We notice patterns of behavior or trends and are curious as to why they happen. We collect information about our observations and use that information to formulate questions that can be answered about the natural phenomena by doing some experiments. The questions begin with why, what, when, and how. For example, why isn't the remote working? Are the batteries dead? Is the remote broken? Once you have several questions to answer, it's time to form a hypothesis. The hypothesis is a statement of what you think the answer to your question might be and includes a prediction that you will test. A hypothesis should be falsifiable, meaning it should be able to be proven wrong based on another scientist's experiments and interpretation of the results. A hypothesis generally has the format if then because. For example, if the batteries are dead in the remote control, then the remote will work when the batteries are replaced because the remote requires power to function. Next, we make predictions based on our hypothesis. For example, if I replace the batteries in the remote, it will work. We then conduct experiments to test our hypothesis. Experiments can take many years or several minutes, depending on what you are studying. The results of your experiments are observed and or measured. These results should be recorded for later analysis and will either support or refute your hypothesis. If your research is complete, you can draw conclusions. For example, if I replace the batteries in the remote and it starts working again, the results support my hypothesis. But if I replace the batteries and the remote doesn't work, the results refute my hypothesis. And I would probably need to go back and possibly ask more questions and conduct more experiments. When scientists finish a research project, the results of their study is reported in scientific journals. Their work is then peer-reviewed, meaning their work is verified by other expert scientists in their field before the results can be published. Once published, their work is open season for other scientists to falsify or to perform more experiments to gain a deeper understanding about the natural phenomena. In summary, the scientific method is a systematic way to investigate and answer questions the scientist formulates about the natural world. 
Science is making observation while collecting initial data, then ask questions they want to answer based on those observations. Next, a falsifiable hypothesis is formulated and written in the if-then-because format. Predictions are made based on what the scientist expects will happen, and then experiments are designed to test the predictions. After experiments are performed, data is collected and analyzed. Conclusions are drawn, and the scientist decides whether the results support or refute the hypothesis. In real life, scientists repeat experiments several times to make sure the results are repeatable before reporting their data to the scientific community. You should be able to explain these steps of the scientific method in the order they are performed. In a controlled scientific study, the variables and groups must be defined. Variables are either independent or dependent. The experimental or independent variable is the variable that is purposely changed or manipulated. Usually, only one variable is changed at a time during experiments and the other variables are kept constant and measured. Groups are the subjects or living organisms participating in the study. The test group are the subjects that are exposed to the experimental or independent variable. The control group is a group for comparison purposes that are not exposed to the er experimental variable. We will look at an experiment that tests the effectiveness of medication on a bacterium that causes ulcers. First, a hypothesis is formulated. In this experiment, to test the effectiveness of a medication on humans, antibiotic B is a better treatment for ulcers than antibiotic A. The study participants were then divided into three groups. In this study, the antibiotic or pill is the independent or experimental variable because it's the variable being changed. The dependent variable is the effectiveness of the antibiotic. It is the thing that is being measured. The control group received a placebo, a pill that did not contain antibiotic. Test group one received antibiotic A, and test group two received antibiotic B. After taking the medication, each test subject was examined for the presence of ulcers, and the results were recorded. This table shows the percent of people treated and their response to the medications. Only 10% of the people in the control group had their ulcers cured. This was the group who received the placebo or the pill that did not have antibiotic. Test group one received antibiotic A. 60% of those people had their ulcers cured. But in test group two who received antibiotic B, 80% of those people had their ulcers cured. These results suggest or infer that antibiotic B is more effective than antibiotic A. You should feel comfortable reading a graph and summarizing the data. When reading or researching scientific information, you should search information in scientific journals or information from reliable sources. These reliable sources have URLs that end in .edu, .gov, and .org. You should stay clear of secondary sources that end in .com. These sites may take scientific data out of context to give the reader skewed information. For example, information on COVID-19 from a dot com website may say that all people over 50 
are at higher risk for death if they get the virus. But a more reliable scientific source will explain that people over 50 with pre-existing conditions like respiratory problems are at higher risk for death from the virus. Scientists should adhere to certain ethics. They should acquire and report knowledge in an ethical manner by reporting the truth and yet maintaining ethics as it pertains to the community. It is slightly different than technology used to gain scientific information. Technology is the application of scientific knowledge to learn more about our human interests. Bioethics is a sub-branch of ethics concerned with the development and consequences of biological technology. Scientists must be mindful of how their research affects the community. For example, genetic engineering of plants and animals used for human consumption is a hot topic because people wonder what effects these plants and animals may have on human health. Scientific experiments may also pose a threat to biodiversity. Because the earth has a high level of biodiversity, meaning many different types of organisms, both plants and animals, this allows for the survival of many different types of living things that eat those different types of plants and animals. Scientists must be careful not to disturb this balance and decrease the level of biodiversity. For example, if research results in the destruction of a certain type of plant, then all animals that eat that plant may be in danger of extinction if that is the only plant that they eat. We as humans also need to be concerned with ethics and the influence our actions have on the ecosystem. We tend to modify ecosystems for our own use, destroying natural habitats of animals to build shopping malls or highways. Changes in human behavior and use of new technology can result in new and emerging diseases like COVID-19 and also may contribute to climate changes like global warming. Living things are highly structured and highly organized. Lower levels of organization are progressively integrated to make up higher levels of organisms and systems. Let's look at how this works. At the chemical and molecular level, atoms that are building blocks of all matter combine to form molecules like oxygen and hydrogen bonding to produce a molecule of water. Molecules interact to form organelles, structures inside of cells which are the basic unit of life. All living things are made up of a single cell like bacteria or many cells like plants and animals. This figure shows a nerve cell the next level of organization is the tissue level, where a group of similar cells come together to perform a specific function. For example, nerve cells that interact to form nervous tissue. Organs are composed of two or more different types of tissue combinations. Continuing with this example, the brain is composed of nervous tissue, glial or supportive tissue, and endothelial tissue. Many organs work together to form organ systems. Different systems perform physiological functions of the body. For example, the circulatory system plays a big role in circulating oxygen and nutrients to our tissues, and, nerv and the nervous system detects and processes sensory information received through our peripheral nerves. These messages are transported to the brain via the spinal cord, and then the brain sends an appropriate signal to the body to activate a response. 
The organismal level is where all of the aforementioned organ systems work together to serve the needs of the individual organism. Up until this point, we've just been concerned about levels of an individual organism. Higher levels of organization can be defined based on how organisms interact with each other and a defined area of the environment. Populations are defined as a single type of organism in a particular area. In this example, the dolphins in a particular area of the ocean. A community includes all living things in a particular area and includes our dolphins and all other living things in the defined area of the ocean. An ecosystem includes every living thing in that particular area and also non-living elements like soil and water. And the most broad level of organization is the biosphere, which includes all communities on earth and the environments in which they live. Pause the video here and write an answer to the question, how do you define life? That is, what distinguishes living things from non-living things? You should know those characteristics that define life. Living things require nutrients and energy. As humans, we take in nutrients and metabolic processes allow food to be broken down into smaller molecules that our cells can use to produce the energy that we need. Living things can respond to environmental stimuli. For example, sensing and running away from a predator or when organisms smell food and move towards it. Living things are able to maintain homeostasis. Recall homeostasis is a state of the organism that is relatively stable. For example, our normal body temperature is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. If we get too cold or too warm, organ systems respond to regulate our temperature within normal range. Living things contain DNA that's inherited. For example, we contain DNA that's inherited from our parents and that follows along with the next characteristic of life, the ability to reproduce, develop into a mature organism, and the ability to pass on genetic information to our offspring. All living things are made up of one or more cells. Based on the theory of evolution, living things evolve from other living things by developing adaptations that allow them to survive changing environmental conditions. As mentioned earlier in the lecture, living things are also highly organized from the atomic level to the organismal level. Biology's chief unifying principle is evolution, whether you believe in it or not. Evolution can be defined as the gradual change or modification of populations of living things over a period of time. These changes are usually a result of selection pressure, which is pressure to change in order to adapt to changing environments. These changes can result in the development of new species, which can better adapt to new environments.